Hello, and welcome to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Timothy Revel in New York. And I'm Christy Taylor, also in New York. This week on the podcast, how ocean scientists are looking back from a year of temperature records and forward to continued global warming. Plus, the future of AI deepfake technology is looking grim, and why researchers are looking more closely at an itty-bitty, previously overlooked piece of the ovary. And how a unicorn in the world of black holes has physicists particularly excited. But first, ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is a condition that affects millions of people around the world. It's often characterised by higher impulsivity, restlessness and difficulties with attention management. And many people who have ADHD find it necessary to manage the condition with medication. But did you know that the traits of ADHD might actually be beneficial when, say, foraging for food? That's according to a study out this week, which might explain how ADHD evolved in humans and why it's stuck around. Reporter Chen Lai has the details. Hi, Chen. Hello. So let's start this one from the beginning. Do we actually know where ADHD comes from? It tends to run in families, right? Yeah, that's right. It does. But the origins of ADHD have been super unclear. One idea is that the traits typically associated with ADHD, like high impulsivity, distractibility or restlessness, could have been useful to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, which is what scientists have now tested. I'm assuming we didn't get any time machines involved to go back and ask our ancestors. So how did the researchers actually go about it? So they recruited 506 people in the US to play an online foraging game. Though not exactly like real foraging, the team simulated foraging conditions by instructing players to collect as many berries as they could in eight minutes. To collect them, each player had to hover their cursor over bushes. They didn't know how many berries were at each bush, so the players could either stay at a bush or try their luck by leaving for another. Moving to a new bush incurred a short time out, so the players really had to work to balance the benefits of getting more berries with the time lost. Yeah, that's pretty neat and elegant, I guess, the modern day hunting and foraging is really (laughs) video games. What did they find out in the research? So before the game, they asked the participants to fill out a survey that assessed whether they had the ADHD symptoms. After analysing how everyone performed, the researchers found that those with ADHD symptoms were actually better at the game, collecting around 80 berries more than those who didn't have the symptoms. Yeah, I really hope everyone who's listening who themselves has ADHD is doing some kind of fist pump or victory lap or something. Did the researchers know why they were so much more successful? Yep. So they found that those with ADHD symptoms tended to spend around four seconds less time at each bush compared to the others. So they hopped between bushes more often. This maximized the number of berries collected, even though they had to take a slight time out in between. That kind of translates to real life foraging too. So back in the day, lots of humans tended to overstay their welcome in one patch of land when resources were already depleting. Impulsivity and distractibility, the common traits of ADHD like we mentioned, can drive people to move on before the land is overharvested to more bountiful harvests elsewhere. All right. Well, this is a very nice explanation of the origins of ADHD, but it does seem like there might be a gap, you know, between a group playing a video game and actual definitive proof that ADHD is advantageous for foraging. So how can we connect those dots? Yeah, that's a completely fair analysis of it. So we're definitely far from proving a link between ADHD and foraging advantage, as the researchers concede and others have told me. One researcher who wasn't involved in work also said that the video game wasn't reflective of the real world, though there's not consensus on that. Either way, it's an interesting idea that selection pressures faced by our hunter-gatherer ancestors, such as a scarcity of food, may have driven ADHD's evolution. It certainly seems to make sense that there could be some situations where the traits of ADHD that we've spoken about can be really advantageous. So are there still those benefits that apply today? Absolutely. So one modern day example of foraging that a researcher told me about was if you're revising for an exam, you might start on Google and click on a certain web page. But if that's not giving you the best or enough information, then you can quickly switch to another one. People with ADHD may make that switch more quickly, whereas others might hang around for longer than they should. So instead of berries, it's information now. (laughs) 
2023 was the hottest year recorded on planet Earth. And that includes in the world's oceans, where records fell like dominoes. This week, around 5,000 scientists gathered in New Orleans for the American Geophysical Union's biennial Ocean Sciences Meeting. Environment reporter James Deneen was there to take the temperature of these researchers, who have been watching change after change unfold underwater. There was one thing on everyone's mind at the world's largest gathering of ocean scientists. Heat. The warming over the last couple of decades, but especially this warming in 2023, has just taken over the field. Matthew England is an oceanographer at the University of New South Wales in Australia and one of thousands of ocean scientists gathered here in New Orleans to discuss the latest research on what's happening at sea. There are presentations on everything from new types of octopus to robotic flying fish, but rising temperatures are stealing the show. Our burning of fossil fuels, our emissions of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, we know that's trapped heat. We know that 90 plus percent of that has gone into the oceans. Average sea surface temperatures last year smashed the previous record, rising around 0.2 degrees Celsius above 2022 levels. The amount of heat in the top 2,000 meters of ocean waters also broke records. And there were extreme marine heat waves from the Atlantic to the Sea of Japan. I think it was the first year in all the records where it was hard to find a part of the ocean that wasn't warmer than average. Researchers here are grappling to understand the drivers and consequences of all that heat. Take the mystery of Antarctica's sea ice cover, which was surprisingly robust until 2016. That year, it dropped drastically, setting a record low in 2017. In 2022, it set another record low, which was broken again in 2023 when the ice failed to recover in the Antarctic winter. Edward Doddridge at the University of Tasmania in Australia thinks Antarctica may have passed a tipping point. According to his research, the lack of sea ice may lead to years of compounding heat which in turn leads to less sea ice and more heat. All eyes are on winter sea ice this year. If 2024 is like last year, there's going to be a lot of evidence suggesting that Antarctic sea ice has changed, potentially irreversibly. But perhaps the most unambiguous victims of 2023's scorching temperatures were coral reefs. Large swaths of coral bleached and died, especially around the Florida Keys in the Gulf of Mexico. Ian Enox at the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration studies the reefs in the Keys. He says seeing so many corals die was a painful experience, but has only brought home for him the urgency of action. Some people would look at this and be downtrodden, and I have seen the exact opposite of that. I've seen people come together and be so motivated to actually do something meaningful, be able to face this head on. Take Amy April at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts, who is working on different approaches to restoring coral ecosystems. There are lots of ideas, but one new approach her team is working on would use underwater sound. Sound is a fundamental cue that's used by reef organisms. We know it is a part of their communication strategy and something that they rely on to create that healthy environment. In tests at a reef in the Virgin Islands, the researchers found that broadcasting recordings of a healthy reef ecosystem underwater increased the rate at which coral larvae attached to the reef. This could help make coral restoration more effective in the face of rising temperatures. It's just been an unprecedented year. But I, the piece that I hold on to and that keeps me optimistic is we are just starting. We are just scratching the surface of putting these solutions into action. In New Orleans, I'm James Deneen. That was environment reporter James Deneen. You'll be able to read more of his reporting from this week's conference in the magazine this week. Oh yeah, and when you're done listening to the most important news of the week, how about some delight and diversion? In this week's Escape Pod, the team explores the mysteries of sound, like the noises elephants make that we usually can't hear, why whispering makes some people's brains tingle, and how to fool your friends with audio illusions. And if you've been a bit tired of planet Earth lately, tune in next week for some literal escape. TV columnist Bethan Ackerley is picking the best brains she can find in the wake of the hit Apple TV show For All Mankind, which imagines an alternate history of the space race. Astronaut Garrett Wiseman and planetary scientist Tanya Harrison join her to explain why they think we should send humans to Mars. If we manage to work out our differences and coexist peacefully, I think it's inevitable that we one day spread out throughout the solar system. I think that's our destiny as long as we don't screw it up. That's coming Tuesday. Scams, sexual harassment, and fake news are nothing new in human history. 
But all these societal problems may now be supercharged by the rise of deep fakes, images, audio and video that have been modified or generated entirely by artificial intelligence, capable of impersonating real people. Now everything from pivotal 2024 election outcomes around the world to the future of individual privacy could be on the line. And even billionaire megastars like Taylor Swift may not be safe. Those alarming conclusions come from a recent article from our technology reporter, Jeremy Sue. Hi, Jeremy. Hello, Dan. All right. So I I remember reporting on deepfakes quite a long time ago, at least in terms of technology, perhaps as far back as 2014. Why does it seem like it's just getting so much worse now? Well, those older deepfake technologies required really specialized knowledge of AI and also weeks of work to make them look even somewhat passable. So not just anyone can make them. Hmm. But that all really changed since 2022 with the debut of generative AI models commercialized by companies such as OpenAI, Midjourney, and Stability AI. So these AI tools can be used by pretty much anyone without any expertise. You'd really just need to type in a text description and the AI tool will start churning out some images within seconds. Other AI services now can also digitally clone a person's voice. And most of these services are either free or pretty cheap to use. Mm, Yeah, so just becoming much more accessible. We also recently saw OpenAI show off an AI model called Sora that can make up to 60-second videos that are really photorealistic. It's not publicly available yet, but what happens even when it is? It really feels like we're entering that era where both ordinary people and malicious organizations can use all these tools to flood the internet with AI-generated images, videos, and audio. So it's just going to be incredibly challenging to separate fact from fiction. Well, that sounds bad. I know we're already seeing some serious impacts from deepfakes, even after news outlets rush to debunk them. I'm thinking about videos impersonating political leaders like Ukraine's President Zelensky. There was an audio deepfake of U.S. President Joe Biden that may constitute election interference. And we've even seen deepfake scams raking in thousands of dollars from duped grandparents. And as Tim mentioned, of course, there are the infamous Taylor Swift deepfakes that included non-consensual, fake, intimate images of her on social media. Yeah, and Swift isn't alone in experiencing strangers using AI to feature her in fake sexual images. We've actually had multiple reports suggesting that the vast majority of deepfakes so far, basically over 90 percent, have been deepfake pornography that especially targets women and girls. And we're even seeing cases of school students targeting their classmates in this way. Well, as we've been talking about how this all feels like it's spiraling out of control, Jeremy, is there any way to fix this mess? You know, does it help if lawmakers were to make harmful deepfakes illegal, for example? That's certainly a start. But many experts also say that tech companies really ultimately have the most power and responsibility to deal with deepfakes. So they could take steps such as limiting the images or videos that can be generated or adding digital watermarks to make it easier to identify all these AI-generated media. Social media companies could also invest more in content moderation to filter out or quickly scrub AI-generated content that crosses the line. It also seems like the US in particular may be overdue some meaningful data privacy laws in the deepfake era that could perhaps shift the needle a little bit. That's for sure. I think even more importantly than figuring out what is AI generated or not, all of our societies will really need to do what they can to protect individual privacy and autonomy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, you might think we know pretty much all there is to know about the mammalian reproductive system. But it turns out we could have been overlooking an important component, at least when it comes to the suite of organs devoted to making eggs. In short, there's a kind of appendage of the ovary that's not new, but it has been dismissed as useless and been largely ignored. And new research now suggests it might actually play an important role in fertility. Michael LePage is here. Hey, Michael. Hi. All right. So what's the story with this appendage and why am I thinking of tentacles just based on that word alone? (laughs) Okay, well, let's do, to go to the beginning, this, this story starts a couple of years ago when Blanche Capel and her team at Duke University were studying the development of the ovary in mice. And to do this, they were creating 3D images by using fluorescent antibodies to light up specific tissues. And one of the fluorescent antibodies they used lit up the structure next to the ovary. 
It's basically um, this network of tubes that extends around one side of the ovary, and some of the tubes actually go a little way into the ovary itself. So yeah, a bit like tiny tentacles. <laughs> Well, and and this tiny sort of network of tubes, they weren't actually looking for it when they did this research. No, this is totally a chance find. They told me they would never have found it if they just hadn't happened to use the right antibody. And also because they were making 3D images, they could see the whole extent of the structure and how it extended around the ovary. And initially, they had no idea what it was. But as they did some more research, they found out that it's a structure called the Riti ovarii that was first described all the way back in 1870. Now, the Riti ovarii seems to be found in all mammals, including us. And for a while, it was actually in Grey's Anatomy. I should say here, I'm talking about the medical textbook, not the television drama. (laughs) But you won't find the Riti ovarii in modern textbooks because it's largely been ignored. And that's partly because it's a really difficult thing to study. It's very hard to see with the naked eye, even in large animals like cattle. And the other thing is, when people did study it, they said, oh, it's not actually doing anything useful. Seems pretty harsh. I mean, the appendix is pretty useless, but we still draw it in human anatomy diagrams. On the Riti Ovarii, this researcher, Capel, it sounds like she thinks everyone is wrong about it, and actually maybe it is useful. Did she and her team manage to find something that others haven't? Yes, so having stumbled on the Riti Ovarii, her team have been doing lots of follow-up studies, and I think two of their findings in particular stand out. So the first is that when they injected a fluorescent dye into the end of the Riti Ovarii, it flowed all the way along it and into the ovary itself. So that suggests that the Riti Ovarii could be sending chemical signals to the ovary. The other key thing they found is that there's actually a nerve connection between this structure and the brain. In other words, the Riti Ovarii could be relaying signals to the ovary directly from the brain. That's really fascinating. Do we have any idea what those signals are for? Like, what is the Riti Ovarii actually doing? Yeah, like like I so often say, we just don't know. But Capel thinks it could be controlling the release of eggs. So, for instance, we know that ovulation is affected by what happens in the rest of the body. If women exercise too hard, they may stop having periods, say. Now, the conventional wisdom is that the ovaries are responding to hormones in the bloodstream, but it could be that it's the Riti ovarii that's actually calling the shots. Yeah. The other intriguing possibility is that the Riti ovarii helps determine when ovulation stops, that is, at what age the menopause occurs. Amazing. You know, there's kind of a long history of researchers, especially predominantly male ones, previously overlooking the importance of reproductive structures. Even the ovary itself wasn't necessarily considered as important as it now is. And I find it really compelling just to think that this supposedly useless structure might be doing some really important stuff. But we're still at might here, right, Michael? Yes, absolutely. So to be clear, Capel is not claiming to have established any of this. She's just saying that these results hint at some very interesting functions. And her team is continuing to study the structure, and she hopes other groups will start investigating it too. But obviously, if she's right, there could be some potential applications, potentially even things such as delaying the menopause and extending female fertility. Okay, let's do a life form of the week, shall we? Here's the animal in question making its signature sound. Can you name it, Christy? Yes, those are the haunting tunes of a yeti. (laughs) Not a yeti. That's a humpback whale. Known across the world, and at least in Star Trek The Universe, for their complex, mournful, low-pitched songs which, by the way, travel huge distances through ocean waters because of just how low they are. And we're now getting new insights into how whales actually make the sounds. First off, it's not just humpback whales that can sing. Other baleen whales, those are the ones that eat by sucking water in through specialised filters in their mouths, they also sing. And it turns out they also have specialised larynxes, or voice boxes, to make this happen. So it's not just that they're super duper big because they're whales. I mean, if you know anything about acoustics, which you do, you know (laughs) size does make a difference too. But in most mammals, the larynx is just a series of folds that sits at the top of the airway. We breathe, it vibrates, we channel those vibrations into speech or other noise. But if you look at the larynx of a humpback whale, it's got something kind of extra. There's this big squishy pad of fat on one side. And when that vibrates, whales can achieve these very low, deep frequencies of around 100 to 300 hertz. 
Another thing is that these whales can recycle the air in their lungs to essentially bring it back through their larynxes to keep the song going, which is a particularly useful skill given that they tend to breathe only every four to seven minutes. All right, fine. Whales are just as cool as yetis. But you know what's also cool? Black holes. <laughs> yes, I have heard that. Are you bringing them up for a particular reason? Heck yeah, I am. Researchers have found a black hole that is also a quasar, which means it's gobbling up matter and emitting radiation like light. And get this, this black hole is 500 trillion times brighter than the sun, as in it's the brightest object now known in the universe. Well, just 500 trillion times brighter. Give me a moment while I fetch my sunglasses. How did this quasar get so bright? And if it's so bright, why haven't we seen it before? Well, how it got so bright, first off, the research team that found it estimates it may be devouring a sun-sized amount of mass or more every single day in order to be releasing that much energy. Nom nom. Yes. <laughs> and it was originally miscategorized as a star when the Gaia Space Telescope first observed it. But the team that has now identified it has been going through the data from Gaia in order to identify these kind of mistakes. And some help from Chile's very large telescope, they've now identified that it is, in fact, a black hole that is a quasar. Its name, by the way, is the very fancy J0529-4351. And it is not resting on its laurels as the brightest object in the universe. The research team estimate that with the mass it's devouring daily, about 413 suns worth per year, it is not just the brightest, but also the fastest growing object we've ever seen. And because of some other characteristics, it may be something that we can actually image or record better than any other black hole, directly, with instruments that we already have. Uh, I just want to say wow again. <laughs> right? One of the researchers has gone so far as to call this, quote, the biggest unicorn with the longest horn on its head that we've found. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to take us back to Earth and the very mundane things we also need to do with our lives, like walk around, open doors and pick up rocks. I love picking up rocks. OK. I know you do. These are tasks lots of researchers are using to trial new robot designs. And the four-legged dog shape is one of the most common ones. So what if I told you there was now a better dog bot for opening doors? I mean, this feels important because real dogs are famously good at opening doors. <laughs> yeah, well, dogs 2.0. <laughs> In the past, robot dogs have been bad at opening doors, just like real dogs. And what usually happens is to try and get around this, researchers attach a fifth appendage specifically for grabbing things and manipulating objects. And that fifth appendage is not a Riti Avari, <laughs> by the way. The problem is these appendages, they get heavy fast and they also make the dogs worse at navigating narrow spaces. So a research team has now trained their robot dog to manage, as many dogs do, to balance and walk on three legs sometimes in order to use its fourth leg to push open doors or pick up objects. Incredible. It's not autonomous. It has to be directed to open a door, but it's really quite impressive if you watch the videos. This robot can actually hold its own on slippery terrain or of being tugged on by a person whilst it's only on three legs. Yeah, I watched some of the videos and I know this thing isn't a real dog, but I was tempted to have all the feelings I do when I see a real three-legged dog absolutely living its best life in a dog park. It's just like, you go, yeah. <laughs> three legs, who needs four? <laughs> You're already team robot dog. <laughs> That's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, you can find all the stories we talked about today in the show notes. And you could subscribe to this podcast on whichever app you're listening on. Plus, if you like the great stories we're bringing you and the great robo dogs, please give us a rating or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It really helps us get into more ears. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.